start recording real quick. All right, so we will be focusing on these two concepts and how you would teach them to beginners. And in case you haven't been to one of our webinars before, I want to take a moment to introduce you to the Zoom platform. So when I went full screen, it probably put your screen full screen as well. And I recommend that you go up to options um, and you exit full screen, or you can hit the escape button on your com uh, computer keyboard. And that will take you out of full screen and allow you to dock the chat window on the side. So you're gonna to wanna to either hit this button for the chat. For some of you, it might look like a speech bubble or you might have a dot, dot, dot more and chat might be listed under there. Um, please do pull that up. We will be um, talking to each other a little bit through this webinar. And if you can make sure that you've either selected everyone or all participants down here in the chat window, um, then we can all see what each other are saying. Awesome. So let's go ahead and give that chat window a try. Why don't you take a second to introduce yourself and let us know where you're joining us from and what type of educator you are. Trisha, our neighbor from Seneca Falls. Hello, welcome. Marianne from Texas. New Jersey, South Carolina, Washington. School garden educator, awesome. Kindergarten and first grade science. Teach fifth grade and the district's librarian. Awesome, welcome, Deborah. Florida and Oregon. Cool, awesome. So glad you all were able to join us tonight. Lindsay and I are uh, in Ithaca, New York, coming to you live from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology somewhere here-ish in the building, back a ways. It is finally spring here in Ithaca, complete with a nice thunderstorm this afternoon. And more excitingly, the warblers and our migratory birds are coming back, so we are having a blast looking out these gorgeous windows. And we are part of the Bird Sleuth team, and at Bird Sleuth K-12, our mission is to create innovative resources and training that build science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. And Lindsay Glasser will be in the chat window today. She's my partner in crime and our outreach coordinator. And my name is Kelly Shaver, and I am our education specialist. And I'm really excited to be talking to you tonight about both bird ID and citizen science because I am a certified bird nerd and I really happen to love citizen science and think it's a wonderful educational tool. So basically at Bird Sleuth, we get to package all of the really amazing stuff that the lab is doing for educators. And we really focus on bringing the power and engagement of citizen science and inquiry to teachers so that they can really inspire their students to connect to local habitats and to start to view themselves as scientists. So curiosity is not a trait that you have or don't have, but a skill that you can develop. That's a quote by John Muir Laws that I really love because that's kind of at the heart of what we do. Kids are naturally curious and we have the opportunity as educators to foster that curiosity and help hone it so that it can become a scientific curiosity and a curiosity that will serve them throughout their life as they think critically about situations that they find themselves in. Because curiosity and questions really are a key part of science. So they're the driving force of science and kids are naturally scientists. Um, they are always asking questions and trying to figure out the way that things work and we have the opportunity to really uh, help that grow. 
At Bird Sleuth, our resources focus on kind of this pathway that you see here, starting with nature connection, moving into citizen science, and then finally to inquiry, where kids are asking it, answering their own questions. And we really love citizen science for a number of reasons. And I think this picture kind of starts to tell that story. So this is what we got when we asked someone to, uh, we asked some kids to draw themselves what they thought scientists were. And so this is what came out, kind of the typical scientist with that lab coat on, and some chemicals in a beaker. Um, usually there's some crazy hair. This guy has a pretty excellent mustache, so I, I appreciate that. Um, but science can be a lot more than this too. And so one of the things that we love about citizen science is it helps people start to go from this view of a scientist to, hey, these guys out in the wilds and getting dirty and probably pooped on by some birds are scientists too. And then finally, to realizing that they themselves can be scientists, they can collect data that matters to scientists and they can help answer some of the questions uh, that are pressing in our world. So, I said citizen science probably at least a dozen times already tonight, so let's make sure we're all operating under the same understanding of what citizen science is. So, in the chat window, when you hear citizen science, share some keywords that come to mind, some activities, or a definition. Collecting information through observation, community engagement, engagement in scientific research, regular people engaging in science activities that don't come from a textbook. I like that, Deborah. Investigating, asking questions, collecting data, observing. Definitely Anne. Hi, Anne. <laughs> Anne's a friend of ours. <laughs> As is Holly. As is Holly. Awesome. Lots of friendly faces today. Being a part of the larger scientific community, everyone collecting data on a subject and sharing that information with the world. Yeah, you guys are, are hitting the nail on the head here. Um, citizen science, we really do view as helping to put the puzzle pieces together and understand the world. So we kind of think of folks, I see somebody put said that exact thing, as everyday people, folks like you and me who aren't professional scientists that collect data um, and submit that data to these big old databases that scientists can then use to help answer questions. So we really do view it as a partnership between volunteers and scientists that focus on answering real world questions. And so that's where part of the power of citizen science as an education tool comes into being because it answers that kind of essential question of why are we doing this? Well, we're doing it because it matters, because your data really helps us understand the world and is used in ways that uh, answer real questions. This is one of my favorite images about citizen science. Um, so this may look, might look like the map of the night sky from Earth, or from space, <laughs> of all of the places lit up, but this is actually a map of submissions to the eBird database. So every point of light here is actually a submission to eBird, which is the lab's largest citizen science project. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. But what I find amazing about this image is that there's no underlying continental map here. We can see the shape of our world because there are that many people out there who care about birds, who care about collecting data and submitting it to eBird, that we're starting to light up the world. And I think that is really, really neat. To put that in a little bit of perspective, these numbers are actually a little over six months old, so we just recently actually passed 
half a billion observations submitted to the eBird database, more than 32 million checklists, more than 365,000 participants, logging 10,358 species of birds, which works out to be a little over 98% of the world's birds have been counted by regular folks like you and me participating in citizen science. And that represents every country in the world. So that is pretty, pretty cool. And again, this really helps to illustrate this power of citizen science to me and uh, why it can be so motivating for kids. So a number of years ago now, when uh, we were approaching our hundredth millionth observation into the eBird database, uh, everybody here at the lab thought it was going to be some hotshot birder who's going to get that special hundredth millionth. Um, betting on who would get it. People here take lists when they go to work in the morning, when they're on their lunch break, when they go home. So that everybody thought it would kind of be one of us. It turned out to be this gentleman here, Leron, who was 12 at the time, and his observation was of an American robin. So uh, our folks in the education department, we were super happy because this is exactly what we're talking about. Because kids really can collect data that matters and every bird matters, even something common like an American robin. So even if birds aren't your thing, which I don't know why they wouldn't be, but then again, I'm very, very biased. Uh, there are citizen science projects out there for you. So if the kids that you're working with are interested in spiders or worms or uh, weather or plants, there are citizen science projects out there that you can use to help capture their interests and get them participating in science projects. And Lindsay just shared a link with you in the chat window to SciStarter.com, which is a really great tool to look up different citizen science projects. So you can look by region or topic um, and find something that will work for you and the kids you work with. At the lab, we have six citizen science projects featured here. Today, we're gonna touch a little bit on Nestwatch and a bit more on eBird. And they all follow similar protocols, identifying and observing birds, collecting data, entering that data online, and then retrieving and viewing that data. Um, and I think number four is one of the things that really sets apart the lab citizen science projects because when you submit data, you then have access to the databases. So all those people, those 365,000 participants in eBird, you can check out their data. You can download data from Sri Lanka or Peru or wherever interests you, or your own backyard. So citizen science is really great for educators because it is exciting in real world. It provides us with an opportunity to study wild animals while meeting our educational goals. It's low cost and year round, so you can do it any time of the year. There are projects that are running year round. There are some that are seasonal, but there's always something available. And you have the benefit of participating in these programs. You have the ability to capture kids' interests and really inspire them to develop a connection to their local habitats and inspire them to really engage with material because it helps. These, these data that these kids are collecting really matters. And as educators, it helps us meet our goals too. So it helps us meet a lot of the NGSS standards, uh, basically almost all of the science practices and a lot of the content um, standards as well. And what's really nice is even across different uh, education contexts, so 4-H, their STEM goals, citizen science meets those. So it's really a, a useful tool to help us meet our goals while engaging kids in authentic science. And I wanted to take a moment to share this map with you because this was developed from citizen science data. This was developed from the eBird project, so it's about birds. And I'd like you to take a moment to look at this map and see if you can make any inferences about what you think it's showing. So remember, this is a project that studies birds.
migration, migration paths. Yeah, so let me refine my question a little bit. Is it migration paths of multiple birds or one bird, do you think? Got some different ideas here. We have one vote for multiple birds and one for a single species. Okay, multiple populations is warning. So those of you who think it's multiple, uh, what, what is giving you, what evidence are you seeing that makes you think that? And then for our, our folks who are vote, voting for one species, I'm going to ask you the same question. <laughs> so Deborah's noticing that the colors, uh, the distribution of the colors highlight where the birds would be going. Yeah, so you can use the scale on the right to see that the brighter the color, the denser the species, or the more likely you are to see that species if you go out birding. Oh, so I think Trisha is voting for one species and she's saying there's nothing showing on the west coast and there are migratory paths there too. That's a really neat observation. And then Seth's pointing out that the range is limited to the north, so it must be one species. And you're correct. This is one species. This is the migration path through the United States of one particular species. Now, Deborah noticed that um, the different colors are highlighting the denser areas of the population. So take a look at those on the next round and what do you notice about where those are placed? Do you recognize anything about that? So some people are noticing that it starts on the coast and then moves northwards. Some movement along rivers maybe. Oh, a couple people are noticing the cities. Yeah, so these hotspots are actually on cities. So this is a bird that has adapted well to human habitats. Um, and this is actually the chimney swift. And if you take a look there, you'll see that some cities are highlighted, Dallas and Houston, Atlanta, Chicago. Um, and the chimney swift is a cool bird because it was adapted to nest in like the hollow centers of dead trees. But as we've moved through um, the U.S., we've kind of taken out a lot of the dead wood, so they've really adapted to, um, to using chimneys and human structures as their nesting areas. Holly's noticing that Detroit is lit up too. Holly, are you from Detroit? <laughs> um, let's see. Lots of those in Lansing, Iowa, along the Mississippi. Nice. I do love chimney swifts. They're really fun birds to watch. Little cigars with wings. They have wonderful little chatters. Cool. So I wanted to share this with you because it's another cool opportunity to look at citizen science data and how it's used. So these maps are actually generated 
from your citizen science data, so the observations put into eBird, plus habitat maps, plus land cover use, plus uh, satellite imagery, all meshed together through algorithm, algorithms that are way over my head in a supercomputer that then extrapolates your sightings and can uh, extrapolate that across habitats to understand where these birds might show up. And this can be a really cool tool for conservation. So it helps us understand better what areas to protect for certain species or where we might look for populations of these birds that we aren't aware of. Um, so it's a really cool uh, use of, of citizen science data that fits into that glorious science, technology, engineering, and math uh, fields very well. Um, and it's just really neat. And, it provides the opportunity for lots of critical thinking too for kids, which is pretty fun. And Lindsay has just shared in the chat window a link to where you can find similar maps to this one, though not for the Chimney Swift, on the eBird website. And now they've extended them to encompass all of North and South America, so you can see a bird's entire migration pathway, which is pretty wonderful. So we've been talking a lot about birds and we've been talking a lot about citizen science, but my question to you right now is why use birds as a teaching tool? What is it about them that you think is effective or could be effective? Becky, I love that answer. Moi G Biv, the colors of the rainbow. Absolutely, they're colorful. They're small, they're active, mobile, relatively easy to see. They're everywhere and easily observed by children and adults. So diverse and so cool. I'm right there with you, Carolee. They are so cool. All kids can see birds. They're everywhere. So Holly's saying that once she starts pointing out different birds to kids, they start to realize that there are more than one kind. And I'm, yes, absolutely. That's a beautiful segue into my next topic is because a lot of times educators will come to us and they'll say, hey, this all sounds great. Too bad there aren't any birds at my education setting. And we'll say, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that you are suffering from a condition known as bird blindness. But don't worry, it's very curable because once you start looking for birds, you will notice that they are absolutely everywhere. So no matter where you are, there are birds. Um, you can hear them, you can see them. Ingrid's pointing out that even if you can't see them, if uh, a student is vision impaired, they have the opportunity to hear them, which is a wonderful. So birds really are everywhere. They're in the heart of the city. They're in the most rural setting. They're on Antarctica, for goodness sake. They really, really are everywhere. Um, and we love them as teaching tools because they are equally accessible to folks. Even if you don't have binoculars, you can see birds around. Um, and once you start to put a name to a few, you start to really understand how diverse and interesting they are. Um, and it really does become kind of uh, like a collector's game of trying to see how many you can find. And it brings color and depth to our understanding of the world around us. Another concern that we hear from educators sometimes is that, okay, so birds are here, but my kids aren't familiar with birds and they don't know how to identify them. And it seems like it'd be really hard to teach them. And sure, there are some hurdles. There are some kids who haven't really paid attention to birds at all before, but I think you might be surprised about how much kid, kids know and how much you yourself might know about birds. 
And so one of the tenets of bird ID is actually to pay more attention to size and shape than color, which is, seems a little counterintuitive, but if you only have one second to see a bird, you wanna know what size and shape it is. That's gonna help you a little bit more. So that's why we like to use silhouettes when we are starting to teach bird ID. And also it kind of helps bring home the idea that you really can do this. So let's take a look at a couple of these silhouettes real quick. How about number two right here? Does anybody recognize this bird or what group of birds this might represent? Carolee, right off the trigger, an owl. La, yeah, you all are right. This is an owl and Holly is actually um, calling out the species. It's a great horned owl. Those ear tusks give it away for North America. How about number five down here? Anyone recognize this shape? A goose. Absolutely. So this is the time of year where all of our green spaces are crowded with geese here in Ithaca. <laughs> and even some little goslings now, which is always fun to see. How about number three down here? Hawk, hawk, raptor, turkey vulture, hawk. So you're all calling out the soaring birds, absolutely. This is some kind of raptor or a hawk. Ian's guessing, probably a red tail. I think a beautio, the group of, of birds that red tail hawks are in, is a good guess here with those nice rounded wings. So yeah, just by looking at the shape, completely devoid of context, you're able to break down these birds to group. And once you do that, you know where to look in a field guide. So that makes that huge book of birds much less intimidating when you start to identify birds. Thankfully, there's uh, a lot more information available to you when you go birding outside. So once you start putting in the context of habitat, it can get even easier to identify some birds. So let's look at a couple here real quick. What about, where's my cursor? There it is. What about this bird right here on the wire? Does anybody recognize this silhouette? You guys are super good at this. Dove, absolutely. This is a dove and a couple people have guessed specifically morning dove and you are absolutely right what gave it away is specifically a morning dove pointy tail absolutely we've had this bird described to us once as an ice cream cone bird so the body looks like an ice cream cone and the head looks like an itty bitty cherry stuck on top and now that I have seen that, I cannot unsee it, which is actually really great because that's a super useful ID cue. All right, perhaps one more. What about our friend down here in the corner? Oh, cheese and crackers. There we go, sorry, down in the corner. A duck! Some folks are getting fancy here. Some folks identified it as a mallard and a puddle duck, I love that. <laughs> and Becky recognized it as a mallard drake. So that's a male mallard. Becky, do you wanna tell us how you recognize that? Yeah, the two little curly Q, oh my goodness, where's my cursor? The two little curly Q tail feathers right there. So once you start to <laughs> recognize bird shapes, you put them in the context of habitat, it becomes a lot easier to start 
uh, winnowing down the birds that you're looking at and getting closer to species. Um, so one of the things that we love about getting kids outside and observing birds is how questions just come up. Bird observation is a really great way to motivate kids to ask questions in science. And one of the other great things about birds is how, as we've talked about, ubiquitous they are, how there are some near you, wherever you are, and as long as you have some tools available to you, anyone can learn to identify their local birds. So here are some tools. The All About Birds um, guide is an online field guide and it's actually just been revamped so it's all fancy and new looking and is actually accessible on mobile now so that's really nice. And Lindsay just shared the link to that in the chat window for you. And this is really a great resource if you um, have access to the internet because you can look up birds by shape. So you can do what we've done with groups. You can look at the shape, you can get it down to a group, and then you can start looking. You can look at range maps and listen to sounds and see uh, likely species, so easily confused species. Um, so it's a really useful tool in that way. Another tool, if you haven't heard about it, which I highly recommend, um, is the Merlin Bird ID app. It's really useful. It asks you five questions, two of which your cell phone already knows, and that's where are you and what is the date? And based on those two pieces of information and the next three questions, which are what size is the bird? And you choose it on a scale here between uh, sparrow and goose. What are up to the three main colors that you saw? And what was the bird doing? Was it swimming or waiting? Was it in trees or bushes? Sorry, or flying? It will produce for you then a short list of birds, maybe 10 or so, that are in your area at that time of year that meet those criteria that you might have had the opportunity to see. And then as you're looking through these uh, op these options that it provides for you. You can look at range maps, you can listen to calls and see a bunch of different pictures. Um, and what's really great about this app is, as the, some of you who may have used it have noticed, kids are just wildly intuitive with it. They understand how to use the app. Um, and what's really neat is there's a new feature that allows you to um, browse birds and sort by the most likely in your area and that is based on citizen science data so it's based on eBird data um, and Lindsay did a live cast of that in our March webinar and so I'm not going to do that for you here tonight but um, Lindsay is going to link to that webinar in the chat window. Another tool that we use to help identify birds is creating a local field guide. So assigning each kid that you're working with a bird that you know is in your area to do a drawing of, write some facts about, point out some field marks like these black rings around the killdeer neck, and that way each student becomes an expert on a bird. And if you have a class of 15 kids, of 20 kids, of 30 kids, when you go out looking for birds, you then have 30 birds you know, or 15 birds you know as a group. So it's a really useful tool. Um, it helps kids learn about the anatomy of birds. It helps the kids learn about ID cues like field marks. Um, and it's really, really wonderfully satisfying when a kid sees their focus bird for the first time. So it's a really great tool to use. A lot of teachers will then um, hang those up in an area where kids can reference them if they have a window that they look at or a bird feeding station. So that can really help. And using the um, Merlin likely birds or going into eBird and doing a search, you can figure out what birds are near you very easily, which I'll, I'll show you in eBird in a minute. And Sergio is asking about the Merlin app. Is it available? only in English. No, it's also available in Spanish. 
and maybe Portuguese, maybe not. Spanish for sure, um, and they're moving towards other languages as well. Another wonderful thing about birds, as Ingrid pointed out earlier, you can hear them. Um, and so it can be a little intimidating when you go outside and all these birds are calling and you can't recognize the voices. So there's a really cool uh, tool called mnemonics that can help you learn a bird call. So um, it's putting words to a sound. As you can see in this comic from Bird and Moon, there's a uh, the yellow warbler, sweet, sweet, I'm so very sweet. Or the uh, chestnut sided warbler, please, please, please to meet ya. So these can help you understand a sound a little bit differently. And as Holly's pointing out, there are alternate mnemonics. Oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada for the white throated sparrow. Some people say is, um, hey, Mr. Peabody, or, oh, Peabody, 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 I've heard too. So yeah, um, whatever helps you remember the sounds, um, these mnemonic tricks are great for kids too. And I do have a couple sounds here that I'll play for you. So I'm gonna challenge you to listen to the sound and then uh, put in the chat window your guess for what bird it might be based on the mnemonics in this comment. This is kind of a tough one. I would um, point out to you that it's broken up into phrases, so there's little pauses between it. I see a couple guesses in here for the Vireo. And yes, it is the red-eyed Vireo. Here I am. Where are you? Over here. Here I am. Where are you? Over here. Um, so one of the things that you will notice when you start recognizing the Red Eye Vireo is those pauses that break the song up into phrases. Let's do one more. Oh, you guys got this one, Eastern Toey, yes. Drinking tea. Absolutely, nice. I think that the Eastern Toey is probably one of the first bird songs that I learned when I started paying attention to mnemonics. And it is really, really useful. Um, my mom's just gotten into birding recently and it's one that I started with for her too. And it is, a great one to start with if you're on the East Coast because they're fairly common and that once you hear it, it's a little easier to filter it out. So my advice for learning bird songs is similar to my advice for learning bird ID by sight is start with just a few. So pick out just a couple that are common in your area and listen to them and just get used to kind of filtering out one call from all the background noise and learning that and it's a, a great help. And Lindsay's going to share a link in the chat window for you to this comic for of Eastern birds, um, which may be useful for you. And the Western too, because she's just really good like that. So let's get back to that asking questions in science part. I want to highlight for you really quickly uh, a couple of citizen science projects that are really wonderful to use with kids. Um, Nest Watch is going on right now, so it's a spring and summer project that's all about breeding birds, where you monitor nests and report that data 
to um, us and that helps us understand how bird populations are doing um, across the U.S. Oops, there we go. So um, this is some of the data, what the data looks like. So you can download paper sheets, submit it that way, and then enter it in online, or there's now a new app that you can enter it in. And what's great about NestWatch is that it really introduces kids to scientific protocols. Um, so there are some strict rotations that you follow for what days you should check and what kind of weather you can check in. Um, and it really kind of brings home how scientists work to standardize their, the data that they're collecting, so the information that they're looking at. Um, and that is a really useful lesson for, for kids. But don't worry if that sounds a little intimidating or you're worried about harming nests. NestWatch has its own code of conduct, which um, you can do a little certification with the kids. Um, and that helps you minimize the risk of harming the nest um, and understanding how the best practice is for checking a nest safely. Excuse me. Um, so some of these protocols that you might see are, are like this here that you can see how to observe the nest, when to observe it, um, how often through the period, how long it should be. So these are some of the protocols. And it will walk you through what type of nest box you should use and how to recognize a good nest box versus a bad nest box. And then it even will provide you with a place to look up plans so you can um, find the right bird and the right habitat and the right nest box um, for your area. So it has this really cool interactive feature where you can filter by region, which actually I think I have enough time tonight to show you, which is great. So let's go online super quick and check out NestWatch. All right. So this is the NestWatch website, nestwatch.org, which I think Lindsay's already shared with you. Um, and you can see here some of the different species that we collect data on, some of our target species, the steps that you follow to get, tar um, to get certified. And then there's some really cool features here. So I'm looking at the Learn tab, and you can learn all about common nesting birds, and you can learn all about bird houses. So, the features of a good birdhouse, or this is the interactive I mentioned, right bird, right house. So we can select our region, and I'll select the region of the lab, um, which is doo -doo -doo, the northeast. And I'm going to say that our habitat is primarily forest, and I'm going to say see results. And so you can see the different species that come up with these banners that highlight if the species is in decline or not. So you may be surprised to see that an American robin is in decline, but a lot of our thrush species are right now. Um, and what's cool too is it breaks it down. This is a kid-friendly design of moderate difficulty to build. Um, and it's actually a nest platform for the robin instead of a nest box. So it just gives you a ton of different information that you can check out. Who would not want to see that little face mm -hmm. poking out of an S box? So it's super useful. And then you can um, download plans to enter to build these nest boxes. All you have to do is enter your email. And that will help you um, register to you for NestWatch. So that's NestWatch. And the next project that I want to share with you is eBird, which is the one that I've talked about earlier tonight. And eBird's slogan is any bird, anytime, anywhere. So it's a year round project. You can go out and observe any birds over any length of time and share that with eBird. So when you go to the eBird homepage, um, if you have an account and you're signed in, you'll see your stats over here, which is kind of fun. And one of the things that a lot of birders love 
about uh, eBird is that it keeps your life list for you. So now you know more about my birding habits than you ever wanted to know. Oh, Lindsay beat me. She has more species than I do. I need to start putting in my historic records. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, I was birding long before eBird, so I got to get caught up here. So these are the three main tabs that you use when you are looking at citizen science data. Um, you would submit here, and so I'll share with you some of the protocols. You would start with your location that you went birding. So I'll say I was in Tompkins County, New York, because that's where the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is located. You can either zoom in with the map um, to your area, or you can use the search bar to type in the area if you know um, the road or something that you're looking for. So here's Sapsucker Woods. And here is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which also houses the Museum of Invertebrates, or Mu Museum of Vertebrates, sorry. It's funny, I've never noticed that tag there before. And then you can select a hotspot. So I selected this one. This is the entire Sapsucker Woods area. But this one up here is the lab building area. So let's say I was looking at the feeder garden from the lab building, I would select this hot spot and then I would hit continue. And then this is where you collect the metadata about your uh, walk that gets attached to your bird sighting, which really helps us understand better uh, where birds are and when. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is put in the date and then select the type of observation that you did. There's traveling, so if you're walking down a trail. There's stationary, if you were standing in one place and like watching a bird feeder. Um, historical is what I mentioned earlier. So if you have location and date, but not much of the other data, you can enter historical sightings. So that's like if you had a journal from a grandparent that had some sightings in it from your backyard over the years, you could put that in. Incidental would be if you were out grocery shopping and you saw a bald eagle fly by and you're like, oh, I want that on my list, or I want to record that sighting, then you would do an incidental sighting because birding wasn't your primary uh, goal while you were out. But for this scenario, I'm going to say we were stationary because we were watching the feeder garden. Let's say hypothetically that I did it on my lunch break at noon. And I did it for not two hours, that is a long lunch break. I did it for 25 minutes and it was just me. <laughs> okay, Lindsay was there too. There's two. <laughs> and then you go ahead and see a list of the most likely birds broken down by taxonomy. So it's grouped by most likely and then within that by taxonomy, so kind of your bird groups. So I saw three great blue heron while we were out there, and then I also heard an American goldfinch. So you can either scroll down till you see it, or you can go over here and jump to the species, and I heard a goldfinch, so I'll put goldfinch in here, and it will come up and then take you right to it. So we heard two goldfinch, and one brown-headed cowbird, and then you would enter in the rest of your sightings. And the last thing that you need to do is select down here. If you are submitting a complete checklist, yes or no, um, and we encourage you to do your best to do a complete checklist, so that's birds you are able to identify to the best of your ability. So if you saw like a little brown bird flip by, but you just have no idea what it was, that's okay, you can still submit. A complete checklist. Um, an incomplete one would be if you were like deliberately ignoring birds. Like you just can't count any more red-winged blackbirds today, so you didn't put any in. Then that would be an incomplete count. The reason we encourage you to do complete counts is because that allows us to use your sightings for both presence and absence data. So in bird watching, as in many science uh, fields, 
A negative is as important as a positive. So a zero is really important information to us too. And then you would hit submit, which I'm not gonna do because this is a fake sighting. Then uh, you can check out your sightings by going to my eBird. You can see all of your recent, oops, sorry. You can go to manage my checklists and see all of your recent sightings and view or edit them or share them with other bird watchers. Um, and then here's where things get really cool. Is going to the explore tab here on eBird, you can start to check out the entire database. So in the chat window, somebody tell me a bird species you've always wanted to see. First one wins. First one wins. <laughs> golden eagle. Oh, golden eagle. Becky, you edged out Tiffany by like a hair. All right, so I want to see a golden eagle. I want to figure out where the heck do I go to see a golden eagle. So I'm going to go to species map. I'm going to type in the species that I want to see. And it's going to pop up. I'll select it. I want to know, let's say I'm in Nevada. So let's do Nevada. We can start to zero in. This is all years, which goes back to some historic records from the 19, early 1900s. So I'm going to say the past 10 years. And then I want to get more specific. I want to say we now. And now it's going to zoom right in and you can see hot spots. So these little flags are uh, with the fire are a hot spot. Um, and if they're red, that means one was seen there in the last 30 days. So you can click around and find out locations, which is pretty cool. You might find a new uh, hot spot, burning hot spot that you've never been to before. You can also read somebody else's notes about their sightings and understand better where you might find this bird. So that's a cool way, I can't close the tab. That's a cool way um, to learn more about the bird that you're looking for. So I've used this, I wanna see a picture. See a picture. Let's see if we can find a picture. Golden eagles might be hard to find a picture of. Aha! Oh, huh. so, so this person submitted Oh, a picture with their sighting. And they actually submitted some data. So if you really know a lot about the bird you're seeing, um, you can add that data in as well. So you can, if you know they're breeding, you can say you saw a nest. So that's pretty neat. Cool. I find these really helpful if I'm looking for specific birds. So in Recent winters, I went looking for a snowy owl, and if somebody wrote directions or had a picture, it made it a lot easier to find without disturbing, risking disturbing the owl too. So that was really cool. Um, so that's one of the features of eBird. A really cool feature for us as educators is exploring the hotspots, which is very similar to what I did. So you can type in your area and find places to go birding near you. But I love bar charts. I love the bar charts here because um, this is like Hawaii, Lindsay says. Um, this allows you to look at all the citizen science data submitted for a region and then uh, see what birds are seen there when. So the Hawaiian goose we can see is seen there year round. So we can see the scale of time here, January to December. The higher the green bar, the more frequently uh, the bird is seen. So Hawaiian goose is seen fairly frequently. Um, we can also scroll down to something like the American widgeon, which is seen from January to April and then October to December. So we can infer then that this is a migratory bird that spends its winter in Hawaii, but doesn't spend its summer there. 
And if we see the reverse pattern then, we can see a bird that spends its summertime there. Another pattern that we might notice is like, let's maybe get out of the seabirds here. Hmm. I did, I was trying to get out of seabirds though. There are a lot of resident species in Hawaii, which does not surprise me terribly. So let's look at the long, oh no, not the long billed doucher. Do, do, do. This will teach me. Here we go, the sooty shear water, which is the one I was looking at before. Uh, you can see here that it's seen from March to June, and then again from August to November. And so that is a bird that passes through on its migration. So we can start to infer a lot about these birds um, by looking at them. And then if you click on the bird, you can see the frequency in a different way. You can see it um, as a line graph. So this is another way to look at data and interpret data, which can be really useful. Um, as a teacher, to have kids learn to read graphs. So you can go to change species as well and add in some other species. Goose. Let's um, northern pintail. We saw northern pintail on there. Yeah. All right, northern pintail. So these are all the city shear water is. Um, it's not. I'm trying to think of the group of birds name. It's like the petrels. It's like a. a bird that soars over the water kind of thing. Pelagic? Pelagic, yes, thank you. Um, northern pintail is a duck, Hawaiian goose, shockingly. A goose! A goose! A uh, sparrow. House sparrow, oh, nice. You can choose up to five birds here. Bee eater? Do you need I don't think so, I think that's a morning dove, do I see morning dove on there? Let's see. Oh, look at that. So now we can see, um, if we look at this chart, we can see that the house sparrow and the Hawaiian goose are seen there, and the morning dove are seen year round, northern pintail in the winter, and the city shear water kind of in those migratory between times. And then we can come down here at our uh, line graph and start making some inferences here about the frequency that the birds are observed. So our most observed is across the board, the house sparrow from about 12% to about 28% over time. And we can see some interesting dips here happening. Um, the northern pintail, we can see again that it's migrating, it goes away. Same with the sooty sear, <laughs> I can't say it. Sooty. The sooty shearwater, you can see the peaks in the migratory time. I'm curious about this big dip here in the house sparrow that we know isn't going anywhere, that they're year round residents. Anybody have any guesses about what that midsummer, middle of summer gap might be or dip might be? I'm honestly not sure. I wonder if it has something to do, fewer observations. <laughs> <laughs> Holly's guessing that maybe people are sick of reporting them. That would be an incomplete checklist, Holly. Correct. Ah, Seth is saying not seen as much when breeding, and I think that might be part of it, that birds tend to be a lot more secretive when they're on the nest. So that's some of the um, other aspects of eBird that you might not be familiar with before. Really super useful for tying in math to some of our STEM um, topics here of, and tying in all these awesome interdisciplinary subjects with bird watching. Uh, we are right up against the time here. Oh, do they molt during breeding season? That's a great question, Anne, about the house sparrows. I'm not entirely sure. I feel like that's somewhat common for birds to, to do right after to do their molting, so maybe. Um, 
Anyway, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. If you have questions, um, please feel free to put some in the chat window. Love to answer those for you. Um, we are always around too to, um, I hate when this thing gets stuck because then I can't hit the slideshow. Ah, I have to share the question bird with you. Um, so we always love to hear from you. Please do stay in touch. Um, that was a really quick overview of eBird, but we do have some more in-depth webinars on eBird recorded on our YouTube channel. So this webinar will also show up there um, probably tomorrow sometime with all of the links in the description window. Another thing is if you need a completion letter, Thank you. If you need a completion letter um, for an hour of contact, please email us at birdsleuth at cornell.edu and we'd ha be happy to provide you with one. You can always find us on social media or um, on our website. Please do email if you have any questions about eBird or you want to talk about how you can incorporate it. We'd love to hear from you all.